Thank you for joining us for this Museum Midday. Today we are coming to you from the Tongass Historical Museum, located on the traditional lands of the Tontaquan and Sanyuquan of the Clinket First Nations. We are grateful for the opportunity to live and learn here in mutual respect and appreciation. It doesn't look like anyone else is straggling in, but if they do, they'll just, they'll just join us. Uh, so I want to welcome everyone to the first Museum Midday of 2023. Uh, <laughs> we're glad that you all could join us here today. Uh, we're very pleased again to be able to highlight uh, the instructor student case that's at the Toby Heritage Center. Um, and we're really excited that we have these three program presenters in particular. Uh, you might notice there's only two here. Uh, Dave Pugh is actually in Portland. Um, so it's been really great to have students in far-flung locations and being able to have hybrid classes that really allowed some students uh, that wouldn't otherwise have access to classes to join us. Uh, so he'll be joining us virtually via pre-filmed segments. So we'll see how that um, you know, segues into things here. Uh, but again, we're really pleased to have all three here. Um, there are so many different points of views and experiences that you're going to be able to uh, learn a little bit more about. Um, Kathy Russo with her work uh, here at the Totem Heritage, or we have at the Totem Heritage Center, of course, in the Instructor Student Case, but you can also see her work here at the Thomas Historical Museum, both in our permanent exhibit and right now in that sustaining community uh, exhibit. I'm hoping we can ask her for uh, maybe a story or two about the Mother Robe and being part of that weekly project. Um, that's what's on display there. Uh, Stacy, if you are unfamiliar with Stacy Williams, uh, we were we had the, the pleasure and the privilege to have her as our program assistant for many years uh, with the Native Arts Studies program classes. Uh, and she has since gone on to do so many really cool things. Um, we're always excited to see her uh, gallery exhibits with the Ketchikan Area Arts and Humanities Council, uh, uh, the Native Artists Residency with the Sheldon Jackson Museum. Uh, just recently, it was uh, uh, each day, Dave Kita also was a, a resident with the Sheldon Jackson. Um, and so we really want to just kind of celebrate their work. Uh, each day, Dave Kida uh, also recently had a show uh, with the Stonington Gallery, uh, part of that group exhibit of Unmasked. So we're really pleased and uh, to see our student work, you know, spreading out in so many different locations and people enjoying it. Uh, so I will kind of briefly tell you who's here, but uh, we'll go ahead and let you guys introduce yourselves as well. So Stacy, do you want to start us off? Uh, sure. Uh, Stacy Williams. I uh, was raised right here in Ketchikan and Saxman. Um, I am coming to you a, a little bit uh, sleep deprived. I'll just be honest. I have newborn twins at home, and so I'm very happy uh, to be here with you all, um, especially with adults who can tell me what their questions are. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Um, as Erica did mention, I recently had a show at the Ketchikan Area Arts and Humanities Council Main Street Gallery. It was called Learning Through Teaching, and that ran March 2022. Uh, that did give me the opportunity to share uh, quite a bit of my work. Uh, I like to talk about uh, nine years of learning, seven years of teaching, and how many more years of that of just creation. Uh, and so during that uh, ex exhibit down there at the Main Street Gallery, I was, I was at the same time, I was taking a class at the Heritage Center uh, with uh, Janice Jackson about the hide collars. Um, that was towards the end of the month. So I was kind of, you know, dual tasking, being at the exhibit or, you know, being in class and things like that. And so I definitely do appreciate the uh, virtual options that kind of came about with the pandemic. You know, they talk about, you know, well, Thanks COVID for all those things, but also thanks COVID for opening up, you know, to us being able to share in all those different ways. Uh, beyond the exhibit, I have been working in the uh, Ketchikan School District for, oh gosh, I don't know how many years now, it's kind of off and on. Um, I do contractual work into the elementary classrooms for the most part. On occasion, I will visit high school. Uh, I haven't been to the middle school in quite a while, but of course, you know, always hoping to get my foot in there as well. I like to do weaving classes. And so uh, some people, you know, they kind of, you know, might get a little a bit of a scary look on your face when you hand wet cedar to a second or third grader. But I will tell you, there is nothing more rewarding than the smile on their face once they have their light bulb turn on and they get it. It might take a few hours. It might take a few days. <laughs> you know, it might take all week um, or, you know, maybe that light bulb doesn't turn on. But the confidence that grows in those children as we encourage them throughout the week 
That's, that's what I do this for. So as I started out as a student, um, you know, I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. I didn't know I wanted to be an art teacher, but you know, that's kind of how it goes. Uh, as far as mentors go, you know, I've been very, very privileged and honored to work under some wonderful instructors, uh, Kathy included. Uh, you know, we had that really great Raven's Tale pouch class that was just, gosh, how much that opened up my eyes. Uh, you know, Holly Churchill, Diane Douglas Willard, Dorka Jackson, you know, has been my, uh, my pretty consistent mentor over the last couple of years. You know, we've really been getting into that, uh, that Chilcat, Chilcat textile weaving and, um, you know, there's so many more instructors that I'd love to name, um, but, you know, you might start singling people out if you name too many, so I'll leave it at that, uh, and I'll hand it over to Kathy, and we'll, we'll hear what she has okay. to say so about herself. Okay, a little intro, so just be like, yeah. okay, because then I'm going to answer all the other stuff. I, I okay. love it. So we, we, can, yeah, we, can, we can ask you questions there. Okay, and, uh, I'll just start with a little intro. Go so for it. I grew up in the Seattle area, and I moved to Catch Cannon in 83 with a job with the Forest Service. Uh, prior to that, I worked up in Sitka with the Forest Service, but I didn't actually live in Sitka. I, I was the only woman on, sur on survey crews, and we lived out in tent camps. I actually surveyed the road into Huna, <laughs> so I was in a tent camp up by Huna. But I, I worked for years with the Forest Service and started taking classes at the Totem Heritage Center. A, a co-worker of mine asked me if I wanted to take a basketry class with her at the Totem Heritage Center. So that's kind of how where I started taking classes. And that would have been in the late, or probably mid 80s is when I first started taking classes there. Um, so most of what I'm gonna talk about in relationship to my, the piece that's on the exhibit there is pre-graduate school. Because I did go to graduate school at UC Davis and graduated in 2000. And from there on, um, my work has taken a completely different turn. So right after graduate school, I had a Fulbright grant and I um, spent a year in Guatemala learning about net bags made from agave fiber. And then that work kind of went about 15 years and kind of led me from Mexico to Colombia. And I learned about baskets and mats and hats and things made from different plant materials. So my focus has really been plant materials. And I, did, I had a solo exhibit, one solo exhibit at the Main Street Gallery. And it was called A Sense of Place. And it basically covered the regions that I had been learning in about all those different materials. Um, I had little shadow boxes with pieces that people had made and posters showing people processing materials. And then I had the baskets that I made that were in front that were sort of inspired and influenced by each place that I spent time. And one of those baskets is actually in the permanent collection over there. So um, the basket that's over there is, what is it called? It's called trick or treat. <laughs> because the, 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 I kind of um, did alternating panels and the treat is the, the um, the um, snake design, or no, yeah, the snake design, which is based on a Panamanian chakra or a net bag. And then the treat, or wait, what did I say? That was treat. The trick is the raven, because that was a raven's tail design, the tail of the raven. So that's what the designs are in the basket in there. Um, well, do we want to go to Dave, and then we can ask Yeah, go to Dave, and then oh, go to the specific Yeah, yeah keep yeah. things nice and little here. Uh, so, Dave, can I have you introduce yourself for us? Yeah, yeah. Gunnels uh, Chish, Erica. Gunnels Chish, Totem Heritage Center, and Gunnels Chish, Achun Kriyan Hat Yi Adi. Slinget Chenach, each da Yuchat Dua Salk. Guski Kwani Chenach, Dave Kita Jr. Yuchat Dua Salk. Slinget Yadi Ayachat Kitchran. Yechat Kudziti, Portland, Yechat Yati. I'm Dave Kita. Uh, I'm here in Portland, um, where I live, and I was born in Ketchikan. That's exciting. Yeah. Cool. And so uh, one of the things we, we asked all of these uh, these presenters, it's really cool for us to see that not only are they constantly looking for opportunities to learn and take classes at the Totem Heritage Center and other places too, um, but they also teach. Um, so I know you were going to talk a little bit about teaching. Is that a good segue for you, Kathy? Is that the first thing you want me to? Okay, we'll, we'll bounce around. It'll okay. Be great. Okay. So, <laughs> so going from taking classes to teaching. So I'm just going to read what yeah. I wrote. Right. So I had no idea I wanted to teach, or that I would teach, or any of that. <laughs> but I had taken a lot of Raven's Tale classes from Cheryl Samuel when she was here during the revival of Raven's Tale in this region. And apparent, I'm not sure if she wasn't coming back, or I'm not sure what happened. But Sue Shotridge, you guys know Sue, she had a gallery in town here, yeah. and um, she invited me to teach a class at her studio. 
And she had students all lined up. She just needed a teacher. And I had no idea what I was doing. I was terrified. <laughs> um, anyways, I taught the class. I guess it went okay. And I remember that the students all gave me a card and they thanked me and they said I did a really good job. So that was oh. the beginning of my teaching career. And then um, after that, I was invited to teach in Saxman back when KNT, back before they built all the new buildings, there was a little building back behind where the office is. And twice a year, I used to teach out there um, with a group of mostly ladies. There was one boy, <laughs> but mostly ladies. And we had a great time. Um, so I did that for years and years and years. And then I've taught a few classes at the Totem Heritage Center. Um, there was one class that was really special. We had everything from pouches um, to the completion of the Grandmother of Lightning Robe, which is on display at the Annette Island Service Center, which was woven by Louise Clark and the late Irene Beanick and Dee Southern. Um, but that was completed in that class, and that was really exciting. Um, and then I've taught a bunch of, um, not a bunch, a couple of like finish up your project classes. And the most recent classes uh, were that I taught Raven's Tale up in Wrangell. Um, I kind of got away from Raven's Tale and teaching me, like I say, when I went to graduate school, my work took a completely different turn. But um, as it turns out, I love teaching. I like figuring out new projects, patterns, helping students, and passing on the knowledge. Fantastic. Well, we're, we're going to throw ourselves right to Dave uh, as far as how he went from taking classes to teaching. Uh, and we were talking about this earlier. There's a really interesting kind of continuum here of, you know, Kathy teaching and then uh, Stacy and then Dave just only recently. So let's uh, hear from him a little bit about what that was like. Now, to that end, too, uh, I know in your, in your everyday life, you, you teach, um, you're down in Portland uh, teaching classes. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it's been like going from taking classes and so recently to transitioning into teaching classes? Um, we were able to host you this last summer for a small yeah. workshop and you were also um, at the Sheldon Jackson Museum as part of their uh, Native Art Artists in Residency program. So can you talk a little bit about that? Right, yeah. It, um, one of the things that I am just really pleased to be able to do uh is that when when i discovered online classes uh for art i also in that same time frame discovered uh online offering for Tlingit language and i began to learn it and uh just little bits and pieces and uh one of the things i'm able to do uh in my job as a high school teacher a uh, construction teacher is uh use the Tlingit language on some periodic basis at school, which um, I do so in remembrance of my grandmother, Eva Kita, who when I was a child, she told me stories about being prohibited from speaking her language at school. And they would even uh, try to get the students to not speak Klingit when they went home. And um, so now I, I just feel like it's a great victory um, each day when I'm able to uh, speak the language at uh, school. But um, when this all came about and uh, I applied for an artist residency, I didn't think I would get it at the Sheldon Jackson Museum, uh, which was just this past summer. Uh, I was awarded that. And as soon as I was, I was like, wow, this is great. This is exciting. My application for that included teaching some classes, which would uh, be very int intimidating to me because it's around my culture, not around thing that I've been teaching. And um, I, with my familiarity with you all uh, and my love for the Totem Heritage Center, appreciation for it, I asked if um, if I could just kind of do a preview uh, practice, so to speak, for what I'd be doing at Sheldon Jackson Museum. And so I did. I, I sat in the uh, Heritage Center there and and had uh, some projects that I was working on and just kind of demonstrated and then uh, would talk to the visitors when they would come in. And then I was also able to teach a uh, copper Tana making class there, the same class that I uh, taught a month later in, in uh, Sitka. And it was uh, it's just really something different. When I teach uh, high school students, they are who they are. <laughs> and honestly, they, they're there just because they have to be. Uh, one of the things that was really wonderful about teaching cultural classes, art classes, is that folks are there because they want to be. And uh, that's just so exciting as a teacher uh, to teach people who uh, wanna be there and they're motivated to get as much as they can out of it. It was a fantastic opportunity. Uh, I really appreciate it and really enjoyed myself there. 
that puts you on the line here. What's, can you tell us a little bit, Stacey, too, about your own experiences? Uh, well, I mean, I guess I can just echo that um, sentiment about the Sheldon Jackson residency. Um, as teaching artists, as artists who are still learning, um, you know, you apply for these things, and I'll, I'll echo his statement, you know, I applied for that same residency, um, and honestly, I, I was putting applications out there. I wasn't necessarily, you know, um, married to the idea like, oh, yes, I'll get this. It'll be great. I'll do all these things. Um, but it was like, okay, I'm going to put my application in. You know, if I don't get it, they'll at least tell me, you know, like, how can I improve for the future? Like, that was my goal in putting in an application. How can I improve for the future? And then they told me that I was accepted and that I would be scheduled for, you know, later August and September and, you know, pack my bags, get going. I'll be there for three weeks and, you know, hey, it'll be great. I'll teach a class. It'll be awesome. Um, and to be honest, it was one of the most awesome experiences of my life. I mean, it was so empowering, so encouraging. So, you know, just being in a home away from home, honestly, that's what Sitka was for me. Uh, for those three weeks, Sitka was a home away from home that, um, you know, all these people, like you said, they're there in that class because they want to be. You know, when I go into the elementary schools, of course, you know, there might be, you know, at least in this class or maybe the next class, maybe not in this class and maybe the next class, there might be a student that is not the most thrilled to be in art class. Or there might be a student that just doesn't have the coordination or the motor function and they know it and they're just not quite there yet and they can't explain themselves. So what I like to say in my classes is that uh, weaving is secondary. Weaving is not the most important thing that you are gonna learn in my class. The most important thing that you'll learn in my class, and we did this with uh, Colleen Smith's class at Houtling uh, fairly recently, uh, last uh, September, was it? Oh, it feels like five years ago. <laughs> my twins are two months old, by the way. Uh, so anyway, uh, in that class, I did recognize that there were, there were a few students that you know, might have some difficulty with the task at hand. And so I made it my goal that week that they knew that their most important lesson was to learn encouragement. And encouragement doesn't necessarily just mean for your peers. It means for yourself as well. And so we really worked on self-concept that week of encouraging, of being specific, of pointing out strengths, of being confident in one another and in ourselves. Uh, also being sincere and honest, because even though you're working really hard, if you did an incorrect stitch, it did have to come out, but we could be kind about how we take that stitch out. And the most important thing out of that encouragement was the effort and improvement. You know, those kids, they worked so hard and even on the last day of, you know, the, the last student who didn't necessarily have the great time, you know, I looked at him and I said, well, did you try? And he said, yeah, I tried so hard. And I was like, well, you get a passing grade from me. Like, that's, there's no problem here, right? And I just remember that from our teachers, um, especially at the Heritage Center, especially with Holly, especially with Diane, that, you know, it's, it's important to get the right stitch, but there's a kind way to say, uh, what was it? Is, that is a stitch, but that's not the stitch we're working on right now. Because <laughs> somewhere in the world, yeah. that is a stitch. Yeah. That is the way to do it, but not here in Southeast and Ketchikan. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad that you touched on it earlier as far as like some of those, um, you know, the silver lining of us being able to do hybrid classes. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I did, I shamelessly took a look at Kathy's sheet there. So I know this is going to segue into the next section too. Um, you know, we talked about, so Dave, Dave uh, he does down in Portland, doesn't have direct access to classes. Uh -huh. uh, I know one of the questions that I asked Kathy was, what was it like finding instructors in classes, um, you know, early on in things, some of those first classes you took, or, or just access to Northwest Coast art classes? Yeah. Well, so back in the 80s and the 90s, there were a lot of classes. I mean, I took everything. <laughs> so I wrote some names down. I took drum making from Ken Decker. I took the Bentwood box class from Dempsey Bob, although I think he did most of the work. <laughs> <laughs> I took moccasin making from Esther Shea. I took many, 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 many basketry classes from Dolores Churchill and then from Irene Phoenix. And then, of course, um, Dolor or, um, Cheryl Samuel, I took a zillion classes from her, and then I learned Chilcat from um, Dorica Jackson. But, it, you know, and I took a silver engraving class, but I honestly can't remember who taught it, and design classes. And there were lots and lots of classes back then. And But I discovered that weaving was my passion, and so I continued to take classes with um, Cheryl and Dorica and Dolores. And I actually took a... Cheryl taught a class down, at, she was a teacher down at the, um, the Chosen School of the Arts outside of Victoria, because she's from Victoria, BC, 
And during the summer, there was in the Chosen School of the Arts, and I went down for an intensive two-week chill cat class with her, with a number of other people from up here. And I remember everyone else was doing like painting and drawing and all this stuff. And we would like in two weeks we got that far. <laughs> People would come by and you know look and anyways, that's yeah, so lots of classes. Right stitches. Yeah. 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 So we're uh, gonna pop over to Dave as far as you know finding instructors and classes. So can you tell me a little bit about what access to learning Northwest Coast art has been like? How, how have you found instructors and classes? Well, uh, the access uh, for a brief uh, time there seemed to just uh, mushroom. Um, I've been outside of Southeast for uh, many, many years, and I uh, kind of think it's like wandering around in a desert if a person is trying to connect with their heritage and the heritage is based in uh, Flingit Ani in Southeast Alaska uh, because there's there's books maybe, uh, not very many, uh, and all the classes are on location. Uh, so when during the pandemic, uh, a bunch of classes became available, uh, it was it was like an oasis in the middle of a desert and it was a beautiful thing for me it really got my um, artist career kick started, uh, and that began in May of 2020. Uh, not quite three years ago, I was able to take a form line class, and um, then it was in January, just a few months later, that I was able to take a intermediate uh, to advanced form line class through Totem Heritage Center, taught by David Boxley. And uh, without those and a few other classes that I've been able to take. Uh, I really don't think that I would be where I am as an artist. So the access, uh, when it did spike up during the pandemic, was a wonderful thing. Uh, it seems like it has waned just a little bit now that people have kind of gone back to normal. Uh, but I would be a strong advocate for offerings that that are hybrid or or online. Here, here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I, I, I'd love to put Stacey Williams on the spot. I'll do it. So you have, you know, um, in your role working at the Totem Heritage Center, we were the program assistant mm -hmm. there. You had your finger on the pulse of a lot of the classes and things. Yes, that I did. Um, can you talk a little bit more, too, as far as pursuing opportunities and things outside of the Totem Heritage Center and what you've been able to, to take as far as classes? Oh, absolutely. Um, so uh, I would definitely say that Ketchikan Indian community has been um, pretty instrumental in um, having cl classes available, um, even if not just you know a small gathering here or a small gathering there or a structured class where we all come together. Um, there were some classes that were born of um, open craft nights, which I know has been you know a great thing that you know you guys do an open craft night. Sometimes they'll do an open craft night. You know you guys try not to run them on the same nights, and that's great. More crafting throughout the week is always great. Uh, but you know, that was actually where I got the class with Kathy, um, is we had the, the double-sided pouch, um, which that was just such a fascinating class. You know, I still, I, I have it sitting in my living room on my little shelf. Um, I have a class display case with my baskets and all my things and I walk by and look at it and I'll pick it up and turn it around and like, how did I, how did we do that? You know, I know it wasn't just an eye. <laughs> Um, but, you know, certainly that class was, um, you know, that was fundamental towards me really spurring on into Raven's Tail um, because, you know, absolutely, Kathy, definitely, um, is we had had to do one side of the pouch, but then you reversed it and did it upside down on the rest of the pouch and you folded it in half. And that was, you know, you had one piece that folded up and that was your pouch and that was great. Um, but having to do the reverse, um, you know, that was. That was quite the quite the challenge, uh, but once you got it, you know the light bulb switches and you're you're ready to go. And it's just like that kid in third grade at the end of his first week of weaving, and you finally get it. And I think as students, we're kind of always chasing that a little bit of you know when we find something that's you know well one really cool, looks really interesting, it's an art form that I'm interested in, and maybe I'd like to learn more about it. But then you get into it a little bit more, and you're thinking, okay, how? How can I really, you know, attempt this? But then you get into it, you dive in, you finally get some of it, and then the light bulb switches. And you're, you get such a, a moment in yourself that you're just so 
I don't know, I, I guess it would be proud, you know, proud of yourself that you could still learn, proud of yourself that, um, you know, somebody else could teach you, even if it's an indirect teaching. You know, I, I love learning from the teachers um, that are physically present right in front of me or even on the other end of a line of the phone, um, but those teachers that are, you know, our ancestors, those teachers that are, you know, just in the archives, those teachers that are in books, the teachers that can't answer your question directly, <laughs> you know, those are the teachers that we're also really, really looking for. And so certainly while having my, my fingers in the pot at the, at the Heritage Center, um, you know, it was, it was great to have access to all of those classes. But again, you know, KIC, uh, you know, Ketchikan Indian Community, they really, they have a lot of classes as well. Um, I am very fortunate in who my neighbors are. Um, I live near the, the Churchill family, along with, you know, all the neighbors in Ketchikan. I mean, not just generally my street, but being that we're on an island and we're a fairly close-knit community. I mean, there's a reason why we have a museum midday at the Tongas Historical Museum from noon to one, uh, you know, just here, you know, in the middle of the day. Like, you know, we can all get together. We can come together to do this. We can watch it on, you know, online later, things like that. Um, but I, I really... I'm just really appreciative of this town um, and all that it has to offer in terms of those opportunities of learning together because learning does not just take place in a classroom. Which is, it's, it's like I've fed them lines here. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I want to add about the yes, Zoom. Please the do. pandemic and Zoom has just been a godsend for teaching and learning and everything like mm -hmm. that. I mean, I, I was invited to teach at the Columbia Basin Basketry Guild, which is down in Portland, Oregon, and they're doing a mix, and this is for March, so it hasn't happened yet. They're doing Zoom and in-person classes. Oh. So they're keeping the hybrid. Um, and so I'm going to do a Zoom class. It's going to be an all-day Zoom class, which I've never done before. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully the weather is good and the internet stays on. <laughs> so this is me uh, spilling the beans as far as character traits, and something that all three presenters uh, share in common there, too, is uh, we love when people come and visit us at the Totem Heritage Center. And any time they come in the door, they immediately make a beeline for the books and what's <laughs> the library there, what, you know, what new classes might be posted. Um, and so we'll hear a little bit that same kind of uh, adage from Dave here about those opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, on the heels of, of getting my first introduction to uh, um, Formline, I uh, also picked up a book where I learned that my great grandfather, Walter Keita, was the uh, lead carver of the totem park in Cloak. And that led me to want to uh, come up and, and learn and uh, advance my, my learning uh, from the beginnings of Formline. And I came to Ketchikan, uh, my hometown, and spent a, a good bit of time at the Totem Heritage Center. I have a fantastic library there. I was able to make use of that. And I was able to go over to uh, Cloak and get a couple weeks of learning uh, from John Rowan over there. And that's where I carved my first mask, which was uh, just in the um, in that summer, the, the, the summer of uh, 21. And uh, it's it's been a fantastic journey, uh, including one, Erica, I have to mention this. I tell it when I tell my story to people. Uh, I was in Totem Heritage Center in uh, summer of 21 and there to in your office there to uh, look in at books in the library. Uh, and I overheard you, uh, you were you were in a separate conversation and, and you said this thing that I interpreted, my ears heard as, and I've repeated as, uh, what kind of ancestor will you be? And in the moment, uh, it just froze me. And uh, I've thought about it, maybe not every day, but certainly every week since then, um, as it just really that that whole summer just shifted my life um, in that, you know, when I think about 100 years from now, uh, how will people look back at me, um, this whole art journey, uh, my connection with Totem Heritage Center, these classes, uh, that uh, seems like it's put me on a, a new course in life, uh, where I am establishing what kind of ancestor I'll be. One of the things that, that you have all talked about um, is the classes and the opportunities that you all have had. Um, what I'd like to kind of take us full circle here, and I think it's been a very nice tease for all of you, 
because we do have this instructor student case behind us. Um, and one of the things I know I asked all of you all is we would love to learn a little bit more about the pieces and maybe the classes that inspired uh, your work in the case. So we'll, we'll throw you guys, uh, we'll let you think and percolate as far as that. And we'll go to Dave real quick for this one. Oh, okay. Um, so let's go ahead <laughs> Um, but it is really cool to have you here in our case every day. Um, so your work uh, was selected. It's in this um, the 2022 instructor student case here at the Totem Heritage Center. Uh -huh. um, and that's what's behind me here. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about your work that's on display here in that uh, in the instructor student case? Yeah, yeah. It's Keit uh, Kitach, which is... Um, the apron, uh, the kita apron, so to speak, that kitach uh, refers to the hunting behavior of killer whales when they uh, slap their uh, tail on the surface of the water to scare the prey into the rest of the, um, the pod. And so I named it uh, an apron after uh, my family name, the meaning of my family name. And, and so it depicts a uh, killer whale as the, the primary uh, figure on that. And uh, there's also an ape, uh, um, a raven on it uh, that refers to my moiety. And uh, it's a leather apron made in a class with Mike Dangeli, uh last winter. And uh, it's leather and, and has uh, copper for the noisemakers on the tassels. So I think it's, it's a cool thing to note um, and to bring to people's attention. You took this class from Portland. We mm -hmm. had students here at the Chatham Heritage Center and, and at their homes here in Ketchikan. Uh, and then, you know, Mike was at his own home. So what was that like taking a virtual class? Uh, it was fantastic. Um, you know, I, uh, being a high school teacher, I spent um, five quarters of virtual class as a teacher. And, uh, you know, being on the other end, um, it, was, it was really nice. And I was really appreciative of it as somebody who is outside of Southeast Alaska to have the opportunity, there's uh, where I am today uh, in terms of uh, as an artist uh, is totally owing to the online offerings uh, that I've had through Totem Heritage Center and then also See Alaska Heritage. Well, and I do have some detailed photos of some of your um, your pieces that are in the case too. So if there are any details you'd like us to point out, we can make certain to things up big for you. Okay. Um, but can we I was going to say, I have a little tidbit. We'll start um, with yeah. Well, just speaking off of the library note, yes. of, uh, I'll shout out to Ryan in the crowd here. I remember getting a call while I was in Anchorage asking me about the earrings um, that are, you know, they're, they're right there and you can pull them up. Um, but the earrings that I had made, um, and they are, uh, they're, they're small, but I mean, they're earrings. What are you going to do? Uh, <laughs> uh, but they're, it's a Chilkat warp. So it's boiled yellow cedar with wool spun around it in a thigh spinning motion. Um, and you, you get some of that built up and then you're able to wrap some yarn around them um, in a, in a uh, warp wrap technique uh, that we use on the, usually use on the bottom of tunics and things like that. Um, but what inspired me for these earrings is actually something that I was reading about in a book at the Heritage Center. And it was funny because uh, Ryan had called me and he's like, hey, you know, I know we have some notes on this, but I just want to make sure that I have your quote right, because uh, they do quote um, from the book um, what I had uh, requested about these earrings. And it was a book about Mouse Woman, who is a tiny little Narnuk supernatural being in Haida lore. Um, the book was called The Mouse Woman Trilogy by Christy Harris, if anybody's interested. Um, but she talks about, or well, the stories about her talk about her helping youth and talk about her helping these youth as they come to age, these youth as they get into situations, these youth as they need to basically, you know, grow up, grow on and, you know, become their own beings and their own adults. Well, in all of those adventures, uh, you know, it, um, they give an offering to a mouse woman and the offering is typically a woolen tassel earring that they take out, they throw into the fire so that it can be transformed into its pure essence to be transferred to the spirit world for mouse woman. Um, but they say that the mouse and mouse woman is so strong that she can typically, you know, grab it out of the fire before it's hardly scorched and, you know, make a nesty little pile of wool. Um, and I just, I always love that because um, when, I, when I very first picked up a ball of warp, 
and I believe it was a ball of raven's tail warp, so that was just wool, no cedar. It just felt like a little ball of life, and it was so touching, I guess. I mean, not to be, you know, like that or anything like that, but just my first time holding a ball of warp, I was like, wow, this just feels right. And so that really is what spurred me to put these in, um, in, you know, in the running for being in the case. I did have to submit an application and all those different things, but those are the earrings. I did dye um, the yarn uh, with Dorica Jackson in a class at the Heritage Center. And um, we had done this uh, very dark, brownish black. Uh, you can never really get to a true black. Uh, that was another thing that we learned in dye class. There's not a true black. It doesn't exist, but you can get pretty close. Um, and we had done a mixture uh, with hemlock, uh, with alder. We were boiling it. It was all these things after we had done some um, oxidization with the iron mixture for several months. It was a very long class. Uh, and then we also had um, this beautiful green that Dorica actually, you know, shout out to Dorica Jackson once again. Um, she had gifted a very small little ball of yarn to each of her students of something that she had dyed herself. And so this is this uh, yarn is part of that ball. Um, though she did teach us how to get close to that color. Again, it's, you know, they're dye lots. You're not going to get the same color every time unless you are like, so perfect in an experience, and I want to be in your class whenever you have that hosted. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, just you know, wonderful times in those classes, working um, you know with the instructors and the dye lots. And I'm just going to tell you that wolf moss does not smell good when it's boiling. <laughs> uh, so, Kathy, uh, you guys will have to forgive me for uh, fan curling here. Um, one of the things that is always evident when looking at your work is your background in so many different textiles mm -hmm. um, and that fine arts mastery, um, you know, that you have. Uh, I, can you tell us a little bit about how long your piece that's in the case took and a little bit about um, just your journey to that, if that's something you Okay, know. so I love the Chilcat apron that's there. Um, and. I'm going to read what I wrote again. <laughs> so the Chilcat weave unit caught my attention when I moved to Ketchikan in 1983. And I don't know why, but it did. <laughs> but it wasn't until 1989 when I returned to Ketchikan after serving as a Peace Corps volunteer in Guatemala um, that Jean Bartos, who many of you know, she told me that Cheryl Samuel was teaching a, a Chilcat class up in Juneau. So I flew to Juneau for the class. <laughs> and it turned out that she was actually teaching Raven's Tale, which I had never heard of. <laughs> So that began my journey with Raven's Tail, and I actually took um, a lot of Raven's Tail classes before I ever took a Chilcat class. And my first Chilcat class was with Dorothy Jackson, um, and then I took classes with Cheryl as well. So one of the things that happened with the, the Raven's Tail revival um, was that uh, the, there was a Raven's Tail gathering at the Totem Heritage Center in 1992, um, and weavers from all over from all over Southeast Alaska and Whitehorse, Canada, came to the gathering. And that was where there's a Raven's Tail Guild that was begun at the gathering. There's a newsletter, which I'm going to be handing off to Stacy. I've been doing the newsletter, and she's going to take over. I feel like there should be a baton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, and the other thing that happened was the Mother Robe was begun at the gathering. And for anyone that wants to see the Mother Robe, it is actually over there in the exhibit, Sustaining Community. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yes. Um, and the Mother Robe is on display over there. So the Mother Robe. Uh, became a, a thing because Dolores Churchill related a story of the mother basket where weavers of all abilities and ages wove on the same basket so they could learn from each other. And that was her idea. And then with Cheryl, they decided on this, the mother rope. And Cheryl designed the top band, which is all weavers intertwined. And then each row on that mother rope was woven by a different community. And so we would mail it from community to community, and it was pretty cool. And then at the very end, it ended up um, in Ketchikan. And the one thing that was not done on the mother robe are the side bands, oh. because it's spiral weft. And because they come down, and each community just wove across, and spiral weft is kind of a difficult technique. Um, we, they were not wanting the different communities to attempt to do it going down the sides. And so um, Marguerite Figueroa, who is, was a weaver up in Juneau, she actually wove the bands that are on there on a, like a treble on a loom. And then we stitched them in. <laughs> so you can look, if you look really carefully, you'll see that those side bands were not originally woven with spiral wrap. They were woven on a loom and then stitched in. Um, <laughs> so let's see what else. 
Um, so my, like I said, my first Chilkat class was with Dorica, and then I went to study with Cheryl at the Machosan School of the Arts. Um, I wove, and we wove a legging, well, uh, we started a legging, which I made into a pouch. And then after that, I decided to tackle an apron. So I didn't take a class to start the apron, I just decided to weave an apron. And since I'm not native, I did not um, have a clan pattern to use. And so um, Cheryl recommended John Livingston to design a pattern for me. And so he designed a generic bird, which is what the pattern is on that apron. So I just started weaving. Um, I did come up for a class. I was living down in California at the time with Evelyn Vanderhoop uh, sometime in the middle of that. And she kind of just gave me a few tips. It wasn't really a class to really learn chill cat because I was already doing chill cat. But finally, I think I um, had quit my job with the Forest Service and had more time. I finally completed the apron after 10 years. And that's actually the last chill cat piece that I wove because then I went to graduate school and my life took a different direction. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, well, well, we'll toss ourselves back at Dave here uh, and learn a little bit more about that class. And to, to take us full circle and, and back to the case, uh, can you tell me a little bit, I know you said, you know, it was high reboot. What, what was the experience like? What did you get out of learning from Mike Piangeli when you took the, the leather apron class that your, your piece in the case kind of uh, developed out of? Well, uh, you know, an awful lot. And, and you know, a, a big part of it was uh, when one is working on and I, you know, I do most of my work on my own. Uh, I don't work with people uh, because I don't have anybody that I'm able to work with. But just the kind of the camaraderie, the discussions, the different kinds of things that come out of uh, these classes when we're uh, sitting together, even if it's uh, we're connected via a camera and microphone, uh, that was that was huge. And when we have uh, teachers like Mike or experienced who are who have strong cultural literacy and uh, are passionate about um, our issues, the indigenous issues, uh, it it really makes a great environment uh, for folks to be uh, built up in ways uh, that go well beyond just whatever the task at hand is, the, the project at hand. Uh, that said, uh, one of the things that you that a person can't uh, necessarily get from a book or a YouTube video or any number of other things is, um, in learning is uh, you can't get your questions answered. And one of the things that's, that's wonderful about that uh, with the qualified instructors that, that Totem Heritage Center has um, any question it, it can be asked and answered. And, and so that really uh, makes this a whole different thing beyond any other form of um, accessing information and education. It's, it's the live teacher is, is huge. Uh, so we would be remiss and we won't put her on the spot, uh, but also in- the Oh, I already told her I would. Oh, she's been prepared. <laughs> Um, also, the, the other dance apron in this case, in the instructor student case, uh, is from Katie Carlson, who's in the audience here and is part of that class of day. Uh, so, can, can I ask you about it? Yeah. Is that the class? Yeah. It, I just um, would say what Dave said. It was amazing. It, the, the, what I've learned from the teachers at Home Heritage Center goes beyond art, beyond culture, beyond everything. It's just great. Um, and the, I've become, since I've taken so many classes, I've become where I need, I like to have people working with, you know, it, having to be with people and paint and just ask those questions. It, I've learned, I and mean, I still message Stacy all the time <laughs> about questions and um, everyone's really open to it and I love it, yeah. So uh, one of the threads that's kind of come throughout again is how often we see you as teachers, but also as students at the Totem Heritage Center. Um, so we learned a little bit about some of these past projects and exhibits. Can you guys share anything about upcoming work or projects uh, with us? I mean, beyond oh, like what, what I well, like what I'm doing, not what you're doing. Okay, I was like, I don't have the class schedule in front of me. I don't know. I was like, I know I signed up for stuff. I am. Yes, I am registered. Um, I'm very excited for Steve's class coming up with the Chilcat uh, design work. Uh, that's going to be exciting. Um, and a hybrid class. So. And a hybrid class. That's going to work out really great for me. I'll tell you that. Um, you know, uh, not having to go in every single time in case there's a 
you know, diaper emergency. We'll see about that. So anyway, um, I, uh, I do have something upcoming uh, that actually was going to be released tomorrow, but I'll give you guys a little sneak preview <laughs> since y'all are in here and, you know, this won't be released till YouTube till later. Uh, That's fine. Um, <laughs> so uh, recently I had applied for and received grant funding uh, for a leggings class for tribal members to uh, be conducted here uh, towards the end of the month and a little bit into February. I was inviting uh, tribal members of Ketchikan and Saxman to come and make leather leggings with me. And so this was uh, just super exciting for me just because in my time of working at the Heritage Center, uh, there were leggings classes, but they were always textile. Uh, you know, they were always woven. And that's wonderful. That's great. I love woven leggings. However, um, I recently got my hands into my father's bag of regalia. And this was a very special moment for me um, because uh, my dad had uh, given it to me for, for safekeeping because I, I have a house, I've got a closet, why not? And so, um, you know, he'd been doing some work on the house, whatever else. And so he, he handed me the leggings, he, or not just the leggings, but the whole bag. And, you know, let me know it was okay to, you know, go ahead and look through it, maybe get some inspiration, understand where these things came from. Um, because my father's, legging, or my father's regalia is not entirely just his. And so in the tradition um, of our culture, which um, I'm Clinket uh, Raven Dog Salmon of the Kate Fox tribe. And so in our culture, you know, things get passed down a lot. Um, you know, it isn't just, you know, well, this person has passed away. We've had a celebration of life. Now what do we do with their items? Um, well, oftentimes these items are requested to family members, not necessarily just blood relatives, but clan relatives. And so my father ended up with my maternal grandfather, Edwin Clay DeWitt, ended up with his gear. And so um, I was able to look at uh, some of these items, which uh, my grandfather had passed away in 1997. And so you can imagine that his gear is of, an, uh, of a different generation than of today. But the leggings is what struck me um, because they're not... Um, well, I'll just be, they're not the most fancy thing in the world. You know, they're not like, you know, they're not painted leather with tassels and everything is straight and aligned. And what, what moves me about them is that they're, they're livable, you know, and not just livable, but you know, they're danceable, you know, you can use them. And they're just these the legging, um, for those of you who don't know, they would go from your knee down your shin down to about your ankle. And these leggings um, will oftentimes have some sort of noisemaker. Some of them might have a uh, design or a, a crest on it of some sort. Um, but my dad didn't have any of that. They had some beads. They had some tassels. They had some little noisemakers off the side so that they would move as he danced. Um, but then he let me know that these are his from childhood. And so he just still wears them as today because they were made by his mother. And so it was just a really special thing. It just kind of started spurring this into me. So long story, not very short. Uh, I am going to be conducting a leather leggings class uh, for those individuals. And we'll be pretty excited to just kind of get in there. Um, you know, I'll have some guest instructors and I'll hold that as my, my, my candy cane that I'm going to hang on to. Uh, that I do have some guest instructors joining me for that class. And I'm just so excited to bring something in that just, you know, hasn't really been, been done, at least not in recent decades. So uh, we'll, we'll see about that. And then I am also really looking forward to um, Candy's class. Uh, Candy McGilton from Metlacatla, her plating class coming up. I'm really excited for that. There's still space in that. Ooh, yeah. Like that. Uh, you want to try it, Katie. Plating is a lot different yeah, than twining. Yeah, uh, it's a mixed level plating class, uh, cedar bark weaving. Uh, so we'll, we'll have more information about that out on the front counter for you all, too, if you're interested. Right. Um, we'll, we'll hear from Dave uh, Kita about upcoming things, but I, after that, I think it's only fitting that we end with Kathy Russo. Um, again, whenever we're looking back, we're, we're coming up on 50 years at the Totem Heritage Center, um, and there's just, again, I, I keep on using the word, but there's this continuum. Um, there's people who've dedicated so much time and effort, uh, and especially skill, uh, not just in uh, your work with agave fibers, and, and we lose Kathy quite often in South America for <laughs> time, it feels like, um, as she teaches and instructs and learns there as well. Um, but the work that you've done with the Totem Heritage Center and just continuing on things and projects like the Mother's Row, I mean, that's uh, things like that, that again, they're part of the collection and they've been danced everywhere, it feels like. I think I've seen pictures of Japan and the White House and all these other places. Um, so again, just that 
that that you're part of this, this larger work that's kind of woven together. But we'll hear from Dave first, and then we would love to have uh, kind of Kathy take us home. And uh, do expect to return to Southeast Alaska this summer, and and I'm hoping uh, that what I'll be able to to be uh, participating in is a uh, totem project. Uh, that's that's really been my aspiration since the very beginning is to be involved in totem poles, and and I think that's that's going to happen. Uh, I also am looking to. Uh, I'm, an applicant for a, a research grant at the Burke Museum and in Seattle, and and if I get that, then then I'll actually be uh, demonstrating and, and doing some teaching. But the the learning part will precede that uh, through being able to research in their collection uh, at all of the you know great pieces from antiquity that they have. So um, class wise, uh, it's it's at a point now where uh, I feel like I. Uh, I just need opportunities. There's not like a um, uh, a listing of all of the masters and mentors who are willing to avail themselves of of up and coming and amateurs like myself. So so I'm just seeking them out. <laughs> For those more tech uh, forward folks who like to follow different uh, profiles and people's work on on social media, uh, we have linked. All of your guys' websites, all three presenters today have websites where they update and kind of keep us apprised of their goings on. Uh, so we have those uh, in the Facebook event and we'll make certain that those links are in the YouTube video when we post. But um, Kathy, uh, can you... <laughs> so, uh, okay, so what I have coming up, I don't have anything really coming up here. Kind of just, just well, so, okay, so what I've got for teaching. So actually Saturday, <laughs> somebody <laughs> contacted I don't know how people find out about me, but anyway, <laughs> someone contacted me from the Arizona Textile Guild and wanted me to do a talk about my work in Central America. So I'm doing a two-hour Zoom class. Well, it's a lecture, more uh, as PowerPoint, on the, all the things I've learned in Central America. So that's Saturday. Oh, <laughs> what time? And you can do that in two hours. <laughs> well, actually, I've well, taught since less than an hour, actually. <laughs> So I have like 200 pictures. I don't know. <laughs> okay, and then um, I'm actually teaching an arts on court class with oh. the Arts Council, and it's going to be so the classes that I've been teaching recently are the the net bag, which is what I've been researching in Guatemala, and it's the knotless netting technique. And I taught a class for them I, last year sometime, um, and we used uh, hemp cord. And this time, so I'm really into natural materials. But we're going to do it with what it's called twisties. It's a copper coated, plastic coated copper wire. So it's going to be a stiff basket. Oh, wow. oh like cool. Wow. And I, we're going to, Kathleen brought out a big thing of buttons. Somebody donated a big thing of buttons. Oh. So we're going to embellish with buttons. On top. Neat. That sounds like so much fun. Yeah, but that's in February. Okay. <laughs> and then I mentioned I'm going to be teaching a, an all day Zoom class for the Columbia Basin Basketry Guild. And they're doing the hybrid which is really cool, some in person. It's like a three or four day conference. So that's kind of cool. And then I'm actually, I still love learning too, as we all do. Um, I'm taking a sculptural basketry class at the National Basketry Organization Conference in Tacoma in June. So um, Ann Coddington is the person that I'm taking the class from. I'm moving away from the traditional basketry shapes more into sculptural pieces. So. That's kind of where I'm headed. That's exciting. Yeah. Hey. And like I mentioned, the Raven's Tail newsletter is going to stay deep. <laughs> Take that baton and no. I'll hang on to it. And yeah. Anyways, so that's, that's kind of my involvement with Raven's Tail has been the newsletter and the guild. I haven't really woven Raven's Tail in a while either. Anyways, that's good. Well, I mean, I've been asking all the questions here. We are approaching the, the one o'clock hour. So normally at this point in time, people kind of like start gauging because mm -hmm. they've got to run back mm -hmm. to work. Um, so if you do need to return and go back to work, we totally understand. Uh, but we do have you guys here on the hook here. Uh, if you all have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them of our presenters here. Mm -hmm. I, got, sure. I thought I heard years ago that the Sheldon Jackson Museum was going to be closed. Um, they did have a little bit of issue with their funding as, I mean, as far as I understood that there was a little bit of a break in, um, where the funding was coming from and different things like that. Certainly the pandemic did have some impact upon their, um, they have a, a youth program on the campus throughout the summer as well. 
Um, however, they are uh, operated by the Alaska State Museum, and so it is the state that is now that is responsible for the Sheldon Jackson Museum. Um, they certainly, um, you know, if you know somebody in Sitka that wants to be a museum attendant, I feel like they're always looking for one of those. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a wonderful facility. It's you know wonderful collections. Um, the program that I was in was the Native Artists Residency Program, I believe. Uh, yes, NA, okay, NARP or something like that. Um, the application deadline, I think, is like today or something. It it's January today, January. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I didn't sign up for this. I didn't put in an application this year. I, I figured, you know, got to get the kiddos a bit older before I start taking off. But that was where the newsletter came in. I was like, well, I could do a home desk yeah. job, you know, and just middle of the night typing away there's a bottle middle of the night and there's a bottle and all those things uh but yeah so um sheldon jackson as far as i know um is stable at the moment and it's the alaska state museum that if you have concerns about their funding that they are the ones who who oversee um the sheldon jackson in sitka yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah uh well you all are of course welcome Mark. we're now open to the public <laughs> uh, so you are welcome to explore and of course see the mother's rose studio. Uh, trick or treat. I'd love to go look at what you're talking yeah, about now. This, I, I can come over there. Yeah. Well, we'd encourage you all, of course, to come and visit us at the Southern United Center and see the instructors do the piece in person in 2022. So thank you all very much for joining us and thank you to our presenters for uh, Thank you, Erica.